how is he? Can, can, can his voice be picked up okay? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, wait, well, no, I, I have I have these pictures here of people that, uh, that have been the club. Do time. you have a list of those uh, presidents? Yes, I have. I, I was the first uh, president of the club, and, and the reason that I was the first president of the club is that I really did all the organization part. How the club came about was what year. Did you first meet, Stu? I mean, the first, uh, what did you, do you recall who they were before the club was even incorporated? Before the club was incorporated, um, Neil Clark and I fished the river together. And when I first came to Fresno in 1953, in 1953 I met Neil and Bob Ryan, who's my present yes. uh, fishing partner, right. and they were related by marriage. They weren't related, but they, the two families were related by marriage. And uh, I was up at uh, Millerton Lake fishing for bass for the spinning rod. And I had one of the first spinning rods that came to the West Coast. And I had started fly fishing in 1938 with a telescopic seal rod in Fort Bragg. And uh, anyway, I came down to Fresno, fell in love with the town. Decided I didn't want to make any money, so I quit the job I had, which I had probably been vice president of Woodbury Mutual eventually. But I, uh, I decided I liked Trump around the Sierra. I met these two guys. And Neil and I became pretty good uh, drinking buddies and fishing buddies. And we'd go up to the lower river, the little Pine Flat. And Pine Flat had not filled at that time. but. It had been constructed, or go up to the upper river above my plot and fish. And we would come back down and we'd stop at Piedra, this little restaurant at Piedra, uh, at the lower bridge, right on the way to Lost Lake. And we would stop there and have a beer and a sandwich or something like that because we were getting in late. And in the course of doing that, we talked about uh, the problems of the river. One of the problems was that the KRWA was making noises about putting a dam right he's crossing. And we had vowed that there must be some way to block that. Also, we were very worried about the amount of poaching going on on the upper river. By upper, I mean above Pine Flat Dam. Uh, there were a lot of people taking 16, 17 inch fish out by the dozens, literally. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fishing people didn't do anything about it, and they still didn't. At any rate, uh, we would talk about what we could do about that and what we could do about rehabilitating the lower river. So one night when we stopped in there, we met uh, Ed Strickland, and Charles Barn Gilder, Chuck Barn Gilder. You had not known them before? We had not known them before. And we, and a fellow named Barney Barnett, who owned a, a place on the river, on the little river. And this would have been 1954, maybe? This was about 1960. 1960. We'd already been fighting this battle with, uh, with the water people before that, Neil and I. But this was about 1960, I would guess. That it says here that the club was formed in 61. My recollection was 60, but um, I'm getting old. At any rate, uh, we got kicking this around over a few years, probably got a little bit smashed. And we decided that we ought to form an organization. You know, we call it a club, but I don't like that term because it has connotations of being a social group. And uh, our goal in this thing would to be get would be to get fly fishing only water from the end of the road at Garnet Bank upstream. And this was partially self-serving in that uh, we, did, we didn't like all these bait fishermen sure. and they're taking these limits of fish out and more than limits. Yeah. And it was big fish water up there. Yeah, and it was big fish water and these guys were slaughtering the fish. And we would take a fish occasionally in those days 
parading through camp up there or something, but these guys were just falling out by the bush. Some of them from Dinuba that we ran across later on. At any rate, but that had probably been going on for years. It had been going on for years, and we felt that the rough fish were taking over the river. So we decided we had to do something about it. And when we were taking it around, we felt the only way that we could have the cloud to go before the Fish and Game Commission and request that they make a fly zone in the water would be to have an organization. So in night, we kicked this around for quite a while, and finally uh, we decided that we would have we would call ourselves fly fishermen. You were then getting together here in Fresno? No, we had we we get together out on the river and kick it around every once in a while. So finally, Strick and I, Strick and Neil and I got together and we decided if we were ever, ever going to get it off the ground, we we're going to have to do something about it. So in 1961 according to your notes. Mm -hmm. In 1961, early in 61, well, as soon as school went out in 61, I called uh, Wayne Music, Buzz Music, who, from whom we bought tackle. And incidentally, you couldn't buy fly tackle in Fresno at that time. Fly fishing was not a thing. Um, uh, Mid-Valley Sports did not no, have Mid-Valley Sports did not exist. There were two places where you could buy fly rods. One of them was Holman's, um, which was uh, downtown, yeah. and the other was by its hardware. Yes, by its hardware. And they carried one or two bamboo rods. At that time, uh, glass was in, but nobody was carrying fly rods. Uh, nobody heard of graphite in those days. So there's no place to buy materials? No place to buy the materials. We bought our materials from hers yes. and from Buzz Music. And hers uh, was the big catalog. I still got a, a hers manual in there where everybody claims they invented a new fly and they're rushing and look at the manual and sure enough it's in the hers manual. You know, uh, a funny story to digress. A fellow came to town after uh, Bauer started carrying tackle uh, and he was on Abbey at that time and claimed to have invented a parachute fly. And I thought, oh, no. you know, this guy is out of his mind because parachutes have been around for a long time. There is no such thing as a new fly, <clears throat> except a couple that I've invented. But other than that, there are no new flies. And, and we just laughed at him. I think his name was Roberts. I, I think it was Don Roberts, but maybe it was somebody else. At any rate, <clears throat> going back, I decided as soon as I got out of school, I got a hold of of Buzz in Visalia, and I asked him to give me a list of the people in the Fresno area who were fly fishermen. So he gave me a list of people, and I started calling on the phone. And it was kind of like being an insurance salesman, which I had been in the past, in that you would call a guy and he'd say, no, I'm not a fly fisherman. Well, do you know anybody who's a fly fisherman? No, I don't. Do you know anybody who fishes? And he'd give me some names, and I'd call them. And I spent the latter part of June, all of July, on the phone, about six to eight hours a day, calling people, trying to locate fly fishermen. And when I did locate one, they weren't interested in joining. All fly fishermen in those days, and I wish it were still so, were loners. I mean, they would go out on the street either by themselves or with a fishing park. And uh, it's characteristic of the sport. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of what the sport's all about. It's it's a loner sport, it's it's not a yuppie sport, which everybody's selling cars by showing fly fishermen. The tree has a crown too is almost a crown. That, that is the way it is. At any rate, uh, after this had happened, I got together in a place of people, I would say no more than ten, including Strick, and uh, Von Gelderen is an advisor, Barnett, uh, Herb, Warren, and he's the only one of the original ones still alive, other than Von Gelderen. He is still alive then, he's huh? He's still alive and he lives in Monterey. Oh. I have his address. Oh, you do? Okay. Uh, and I think you ought to be invited sometime yes. to a dinner. Or he will be, as soon as I get that address from okay. him. And then uh, we got together in the 
in a beating room at the Department of Fish and Game and organized. And we decided that our first objective was going to be to get fly fishing only water from, uh, from Garnet Dyko with the idea that if they weren't taking fish out of there, this would improve the fishery because there were rough fish up there too, hardheads and, and squawfish and something. And we didn't want to see the imbalance. So this was the initial goal? This was the initial goal uh, of the thing, although we had already had problems with the KRWA prior to that. But, but you weren't trying to tackle them at that time? We were not trying to tackle them because uh, things had not exacerbated to the point where we thought that a dam was in them. How was the fishing at that time in the lower river below? Did the dam not fill? The dam was filled by then. The, the, no. The, the main, lake. Well, yeah, it was filled by then. But when I got here in 53, the fishing in the lower river from from the swinging bridge, which is at uh, Maxon's, where uh, they don't call it Maxon, so. Oh, before you go up the road toward the end of the road, the, right. the place where they got the know, right. Right. They had a swinging bridge across there. Yeah. And the lake was not filled. And we could catch fish all the way from the swinging bridge up. However, a lot of it was smallmouth water. Oh. Uh, when the dam filled, which was about 55, I think, then we started getting, uh, and trout had been in the lower river before that. But it was kind of a thing where floodwaters would take them down, or you know, they, they would go. The water was a little too warm down there, and it was more smallmouth water. It was a warm water fishery. In all, although originally the river had a salmon run. Right. Originally the river flowed into the Lake Basin and then into the San Francisco Bay. Right. I understand there was even a steelhead run and, at and, one time. And there was a salmon and steelhead run, so some trout were in that lower river section, which is something I've been going around with the DFG about. <clears throat> At any rate, we considered a primary smallmouth fishery because we went up uh, across the bridge of Trimmer. That's what I was trying to think of. Oh, yeah. Across the bridge of Trimmer and up the dirt road the other side of the Bailey Bridge. And then fish from the Bailey Bridge up. Fishing was good. The fishing was great, really great fishing above Garnet Dyke. Yeah, it was a trek because it took a lot of time to get up there without a, a good road. Mm -hmm. And we would go up there and, and stay overnight at Second Plains, which is about two miles above Garnet Dyke. Was there, was there a road up on that side of the river, on the north side of the there river? There was a road that? on the north side of the river as far as, far as Garnet Dyke. Because that had been a, a that had been a mine, an active mine. Was well, there was there? a tungsten mine in there, and there were uh, Well, there were two brothers that had a mine up there, and their mother. Oh yeah. And I can't remember their name all the time. But there was an old, also an old man who, who had planes all along the river. Um, there's a hermit. Uh, oh my God! Let me call somebody on the phone to get his name because he was a real character, uh, and he's the guy that that uh, dealt with, uh, you've heard of Louis line there, which is in what we call bathtub pool, before you get to the end of the road. Well, this old man, Quigley, name was Quigley. He was about uh, four foot eight. He was a hermit. And a hermit, and we have some stories about him. He would pack a whole case of beans on his back up that trail, and you couldn't stay with him. The little guy, and he just went up that trail with me. Cut. We we got kind of friendly with uh, Quigley, who's dead now. At any rate, our, our getting back to the club, our pride thing in the club was was to get organized and have enough clout to go to Sacramento and try to get this in hope of rehabilitating the water. In the meantime, Ron Gilbert was responsible for the name because he said, just don't call it fly fishers or Fresno fly fishers or something like that. Call it fly fishermen 
for conservation. His now because of political, he, he put the conservation in. Yeah. And because of political correctness, and because we wanted to let a lady be a president, <laughs> we changed it to fly fishers for conservation. But it, it was originally fly fishers, right. and there weren't any lady fishers, and there weren't any there weren't any fly fisher man who wanted to belong to a club. Right. And and uh, even when we explained the goal of the club, they didn't want to do it. What what was what did Von Gelder do? What was his well, job? Von Gelder was a biologist for the Department of Fish and Game. Okay. And he was a fly fisherman, and I fished with him quite a bit. And he later got transferred out of this area in the warm water fisheries over in San Luis Obispo because he had been acted with us, and the DFG never liked us. The, uh, the word yeah. said it was, uh, they harassed us. Uh, and still do. And is he? He's yeah. not still alive. Von Gilder is still alive. Oh, okay. Uh, he was never a, an official member of the club. Hmm. Uh, I see. He wasn't. He wasn't part of it. He's board. listed on the original founders, but right. I don't think he was on the board of directors. Okay. Uh, I can tell you about about. Uh, the original founders, if you want, before we go on. Well, sure. I'd I go on for hours. I mean. One Good. question, uh, did the Department of Fishing and Game object to his interest in the club at that time? Eventually. They did. Not at that time. At that time, it was all cooperation. But later on, uh, because the wardens didn't like us, because we created an enforcement problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they thought we were elitists. And uh, in a sense, we were because nobody was, you know, everybody had given up fly fishing who'd ever done it for spinning. And so, you know, we we ran into, he ran into a buzzsaw. And he never would say that, but he changed his whole, he just went hands off on exactly. us eventually when he got transferred. Uh, anyway, the upshot of this was after calling these people and calling a meeting, and if you have my records, which I turned over to the club, mm -hmm. I had a mimeograph deal, which was our first meeting, really, we our had first that. official meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, so we decided to go to Sacramento, and I went up with Ed Strickland. Were you a club at this time? Yeah, we were a club at this time. Well, I didn't go up until we were a club, and I went up there. And went before the the, uh, the Fish and Game Commission and told them my reasons for wanting to do this. And I said, we're a club of 100 to 150 members. You had that many? No, no we had 10. But I lied. Yeah. yeah. You know, was there a club in Bicelli at that time? No. Was it was it a club we were the first fly fishing club in the state of California. Mm -hmm. There were other clubs which were casting clubs, club, yeah. but other than the possibility that there was some sort of a club organization, and I've never been able to track it down, we were the first fly fishing club in the city. Uh, we went up to the commission and we were successful. Now, because of lack of, of enforcement, nobody paid much attention. Uh, I, I posted signs up there. Uh, you know, all sorts of things. Way back then. Mm -hmm. Way back then for the DFG. They were paper signs. I mailed them on trees all the way to section lines and above. And somebody came along and ripped them off right behind me. I mean, yeah. you know, they just uh, were not going to put up with this. Any confrontations between the... Uh... Well, I had confrontations with people over the Baker Show. That's what I mean. You know, which was pretty risky because all this very guns up there. Uh, well, things haven't changed. Mainly to shoot snakes, you know. Nowadays, we carry guns for self-protection. Yeah. But these people out there were, you know, hillbillies, uh, a lot of them. And the guys that were fishing the river lived in that proximity. Yeah. And, and they, they didn't want anybody messing no. with it. I, I stood in the river during deer season one time, and I noticed the fish rising down from me. And, and uh, about three or four seconds later, I heard a pow. And I did that about, I heard that about three times, and it dawned on me that some deer hunter was shooting in the river right next to me. Jeez. So I got out. 
Uh, another time, Neil and Bob and I were up there at the end of the road, and we were up at 6 o'clock in the morning fishing, and we came through this deer hunter's camp for two sides. Somebody threw a potato at one of the deer hunters, and he came up shooting with a, with a, a hog leg. So, I mean, you know, everybody carried guns. Uh, just for target practice, nothing else. Excellent. At any rate, we we had the we had the uh, the club form, and we got this going. And then I was made the first president because I guess because I was handsome and dressed up brother. And then Neil, my fishing buddy, was the second president. And then uh, by this time we had recruited quite a few members, so we had uh, uh, Doyle, Bob Ordman. And Ed Strickland, who'd been with us from the beginning, had always been Secretary of Treasury. And we decided to write a... Ed Strickland designed the, the patch, our club patch. Oh, uh, okay. We decided to have a club paper, you know. And that was called Lido, and that was my... Uh, I, I named it Lido, because that stuff you put on to repel insects in those days was called fly dope and it had a double meaning. Dope. You're going to get the dope yeah. without fly yeah. fish. Yeah. So, so it wasn't the glue. The, it isn't no, the no, dope no, that like... No. Oh, no. okay. Fly dope came from... We used to call stuff that we put on our faces. Right. Insect repellent. Fly dope. Oh, I didn't oh. know that. And, uh, oh, I always thought it was the glue that uh, you used to tie on, yeah. you know. And then, oh. and then I got the idea that it would be, you know, fly dope would be the dope on fly fishing around here. The format, right. from what I observed in the first year or so, was that there would be quite a lengthy letter, either from you or Neil Clark, that, and then a subsequent sheet or two that was called the fly dope, and those apparently would go yeah. out together. Yeah. Well, it all, it all was part. The fly dope was written by primarily by Ed Strickland and myself. I, when I wrote, I went under the pseudonym of Wooly One, uh, because I didn't find anybody coming back on me and arguing with me. And uh, I, way back before I ever came down here, there was a place called Spiros in San Francisco, which was the only place you could buy fly tack. before Abercrombie and Finch and Bruce Atkins and all that. So. And I went in there one time and asked this guy to tie me a dozen flies. So it was a fly tire. And he said, what do you want? And I said, I want woolly worms. I want to be sure they float well. And the guy looked at me and he said, woolly worms? And I said, yeah. I didn't know anything about flies. And, and to me, a woolly worm was something that was supposed to look like a caterpillar and float. Mm -hmm. They looked like a dam. He tied it for me, but he thought I was crazy to hell because a woolly worm that's a sucking fly, you know. I had to dry woolly worm. So I, I, by that time, I knew enough about flies to, to know. But I, I decided I'd just call myself a woolly worm. Uh, at any rate, we we put out, uh, it's awfully hard to get somebody to write for it. Uh, and we could get contributions. So during those first years, I'd say the first five years, they were all written by Strick or myself, or we get a contribution from Ireland during the Brazil time. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had some pretty good contributions. And then, you know, periodically we get somebody to write it. And I don't have my copies anymore, so I don't know, you know, it would be a help if I We did. do. When you say Ireland is contribution, you mean the articles he wrote? The articles. Yes, so it's your great stuff. And uh, then, uh, after that, uh, Ed Strickland, then Neil Clark ran again, and, I, and by this time I was, you know, I don't want any more to do with being an officer, I'll be a whatever, but not an officer. Then at 69, 70, Ed Schroeder, uh, we were having a meeting at the Sir McCarroll room in uh, the public library downtown, and Ed Schroeder was, I would guess, about 18 years old somewhere between 16 and 20. And he was a new fly fisherman. And by that time, we had uh, had lessons. 
uh, in the park for beginners. And he was one of the ones. He tells the story that I uh, that I was teaching at the Cass out Murray Park and that uh, I watched him a little bit and I said, why don't you take a call? <laughs>
Okay, off that, back to the book. Uh, we had a lot of fun going to these things and met a lot of influential casters. Alan Burr and his wife Burr down in LA. And a lot of people that, that, that were very influential. But at any rate, going on, can I ask a quick question going back to when you first went up to Sacramento after the club was formed and you went before the commission to ask uh, that the water above granite, granite tide be limited to fly fishing only? Fly fishing only. Was barbless hook or just fly fishing only? I, I don't think it was barbless hook. It was fly fishing only with no keep. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't remember. It might have been with a two fish line. And the limit is, was 10. Is that what it is now? I don't know. I don't pay any attention now because I, I never keep a fish, so... Yeah, right. Now, it, go ahead, go ahead but I mean, it's still fly fishing water. Hmm? It's fly fishing yes. only water, though. I think so. Well, I think it's well, no keeper. Yeah. Sure. yeah, I think it is a bug garnet dike, no keeper, or two fish. No, I think it's no keeper, bug garnet, garnet dike, two fish. Two from the, from the bridge up to garnet dike. Yeah. Okay. And any, any kind of tackle, though. Did the commission rule at the time you were up there, or, or did they take it under advisement and well, then issue a ruling later? Well, I wonder what I the don't procedure know. was. I, you know, I've been before the commission several times, and I really can't remember. You go up and you testify, and I think they take it under advisement. I'm not sure. And then it shows up in the regulations. It shows up. Yeah. Uh, well, that was quite an accomplishment. Actually, yeah, I went with uh, with 110 members from the only had 10. <laughs> yeah, you know, hope I had to lie a little bit. Uh, there's some things I'll kick back to, but why don't we go through this list of presidents? Because I can tell you something about each about some. Okay. Uh, after uh, Ed Schroeder became Darwin Atkin, Darwin Atkin was a fly tire. By this time, we were all in the fly tying. And the club was big, you know, it, it was 150 members or more. And we we had all these various activities going on. I can get back to those. But uh, Darwin lived in uh, Porterville, still does. And he would come up here to the meetings, and, and so he got elected president. And he quit about 10 times as president because you have to know that the people who were really dedicated to the club and conservation, our board meetings were riots. I mean, everybody screaming at everybody else. They were literally, you had to mediate between members of the board because every one of them was bright in those days. Every one of those guys uh, was a smart guy. Every one of them was vociferous. Every one of them had an opinion, and if you wanted to get something done, you lined up people before you went to the board meeting to get it done, because you could be sure that somebody was going to throw a monkey wrench in. And I think that's great. I think it's the way I think board meetings should be screaming matches. I think people ought to be concerned enough about what they believe in to fight fight for the position. And, and take a position. Yeah. As it is now, you go to a board meeting and there are people that sit there and they take a position. And it's been that way for years. Anyway, of the two, well, three of us were really rabid people. Neil Clark, Ed Strickland, and myself. And all three of us drank. All three of us were pretty complete profane. All three of us like the look of women. Strickland was a picture. Um, I don't really record that. Uh, I know more than one lady Mark said, get your hand off my knee. You know? uh, and, and this is a dinner meeting. Uh, Neil Clark, what was his profession? Neil Clark was a foreman, a uh, maintenance foreman for electric substations and so on uh, with PGP. And Ed Strickland? Ed Strickland was retired from the Army and an insurance salesman. And of the three of us, all three of us were pretty good at writing. Uh, being an English teacher, I can write. 
of a Strickland was excellent at writing. And when he would write a letter, he would call me on the phone and say, what do you think of this? And I would say, you can't say that. And he changed it. And his letters were masterpieces. Mm -hmm. But they were perfect. Uh, he, he, uh, if you know John Cummings, Ed Strickland was the same cut of cloth, except Ed was extremely bright. Uh, and I think John's bright too, but he was profane, and he didn't mind calling somebody a son of a bitch, you know, in print. And I, I'd say, you can't say that. Say, I think you're mistaken, badly mistaken, you dumb SOB or something. Right. You know, in other words, I, I would try to get him to temper his language, and he did. And he, he was, he wrote all the time. He wrote letter after letter after letter. Yes, I did too, but I, I burned out on it. I do not like to write to the state. I hate writing. Uh, it, to me, I'd rather read a book or you know, whatever I want to be. I don't want to write. There's also a lot of correspondence, in, inter, uh, intra club correspondence between you, you people back then. I mean, we, we found things here looking through. It wasn't all done on the phone. There would be oh, no, nothing oh, no. and, and he would write to people in, in various areas. In fact, Ed and I uh, went out proselyting, uh, trying to get other clubs for uh, We formed the San Jose Club, we formed the Club in Sacramento, we formed the Club in Modesto. Uh, we, we went around trying to form other clubs. And we had members from like Doug Prince, who was famous as a fly tire, probably the best fly tire I've ever known, uh, was from Monterey. You know, I fished with that. Was Art Escola a member of the club by that time? Art Escola was a member within the first two years. Uh, I don't know quite when he got in. I'd say probably the first year. But he, he was not a charter member, but I think he got in the first year. And Art Escola was a work. I mean, he did treasurer duty for years and secretary treasurer. And you know, very quiet, the perfect gentleman I knew heard it square. Well, the, the letters, the copies of the letters that he would send to members, you know, uh, they would write him a note. He would correspond yeah. back and plead with them to rejoin or yeah. 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 Well, out. One of the problems we had was people would join and then they'd drop out. Yeah. And it's been a continuum problem. We probably had 3,000 members. <laughs> Different people over the area. Yeah. yeah. And people join and, and drop out. Getting back to that route, well, uh, you want me to go to the presidents, you want me to go back no, to that's, the that's original good. founders. Let's use that just as a talking point. Okay. Uh, at any rate, I want Darwin Adjun. Well, Darwin Adjun was the whole meeting. And then Sunday morning without fail, every month, I would get a phone call Darwin Adjun. I resigned. And I said, well, Strick call you about this time. Because Strick would call him on the phone and just scream at him, yell at him. He's lousy. I wouldn't talk to Strick for six months long time because he called me a name that I wouldn't take. And I just thought, I'm not going to take this crap. Well, every month, Darwin would resign. And then, he, he called me on a Sunday morning, and I think, oh, God, it's Darwin. And he, Stop well, I'm talking about the...